Hey guys, uh, Brian from Starlight Pulp here. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. And uh, tonight we've got uh, Skip Heller on, who is a band leader, a musician, a producer, kind of does everything in the in the musical world, and has has a new album out here uh, by the Hollywood Film No Orchestra called Dark Passages. Um, back cover as well. I love the back. It looks like a a, a, a blue note thing going on there, and. Um, so we're going to talk tonight about the new album. We're going to talk a little bit about his experience, which varies from everything to uh, rockabilly to exotica to uh, rock and roll and jazz and everything in between. So, um, so Skip, how you doing tonight, man? Oh, fine. Thank you for asking. Are you uh, are you in Northern California or are you in Palm Springs today? I'm in Palm Springs, man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, I wasn't sure because the record got sent one way and you said you were going to be someplace else right yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no I'm, I'm yeah i'm i'm out here tonight and um yeah it's so 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 talk to me about the album we got uh first off this is the first album by this group right uh yeah. called the hollywood film the orchestra so so how did how did the album come about well i've, I've been making records uh for since 1992 and when i first got to LA in like 95 literally the first thing I did was a film noir arrangement of days of wine and roses for a Mancini tribute record okay then there's then I, I did a jazz quartet record that opened with a film noir tune so I've always I, I've always worked a certain quantity of this mm -hmm. um into the records I make although I with the exception of um a music with spoken word CD I did with the true crime author, John Gilmore. Okay. I never devoted just a whole program to film noir. And uh, something I always wanted to do because I just, I love the music so much. In 2013, I believe it was, I got called uh, Otto, who runs Tiki Oasis. Okay. Otto yeah. Otto I uh, said, you know, we're doing a spy theme this year. Would you want to do like a crime jazz group? Mm -hmm. And uh, I did what was basically a small version of this group. I think it was six pieces. And, you know, off we went. And I said, you know, I'd really like to do that again. But I want it to be more on the scale of what the music was when it was written for television, for film, whatever. Sure. So slowly but surely over years. And then we were supposed to make our debut um in well basically the week everything in california got shut down because of covid right would have been the first week so there had been a few rehearsals and then when we came out of the quarantine i spoke to um dj baz barry at jazzville in palm springs and he said oh i love the idea i'd love to present it and at the end of the night people were walking up to us uh it was received very kindly um i think people were responding really to a better performance than they got but everybody was saying <laughs> um when when's the record coming out so i just said i don't know i put together a gofundme Let's and just, yeah yeah just sent everybody emails like who i know basically anybody who's just been supportive consistently over the years i didn't want to just bother everybody and we raised about five thousand dollars and went and recorded it very quickly. So it was just ever since I was a kid and I discovered what film was. Mm -hmm. It's like I grew up in a house that like we didn't do foreign films. Uh, the records around the house were Barry Manilow and Neil Diamond. There wasn't <laughs> there right. wasn't jazz or classical music or anything like okay. that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But the other side of it was, you know, my mother's a librarian. So when you're six years old, you get a library card. And Heck yeah. You, you figure out how to do your own research. And I started going to see um, foreign films and then film noir. I, I remember the first sort of film noir double bill I went to see was The Thin Man and Rafifi. Nice. And we did Rafifi on this record. And yeah, yeah. The Thin Man was great, but I, you know, I was kind of expecting it will be because Orson Welles had this enormous reputation. But Rafifi just blew me away. I mean, it was like, oh, film is a language, right? And, very cool. Yeah. So you know, like 
I started collecting all kinds of different film scores. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the one that really, the thing that pushed me over, and this sort of points to my entire later life, was the yellow B-52s album. Okay. Because the review of it said, like, Peter Gunn guitars and Ema Sumac vocals. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, I don't know what Peter Gunn is, but I saw a copy of it for $2 at, in the budget rack at the Clover department store. So I bought Peter Gunn, and I just fell in love with it immediately. And I started buying more and more Henry Mancini stuff from the 60s. Because sure. back, back then, this is the early 80s, it wasn't collectible. Right. It was always in the, the it was a dime at the thrift oh, store. Oh, yeah. It was, it was yeah. a quarter at the used bookstore. Yeah. If you wanted I, to be swank about it. Yeah, absolutely. And then I just started noticing more and more, uh, you know, like everything from Chinatown and Taxi Driver to uh, The Hustler. Right. Um, and, and, we, and we did a couple of cues from The Hustler. And you do, you do Chinatown on this, too. We do Chinatown. It's the second time I've recorded recorded it um in 2004 i think on and on a cd i did called fake book uh -huh. and we did it as a as a vehicle for robert trasnan who was a great exotica composer but he was the saxophone player in my quartet so nice. i said well did he loved jerry goldsmith so I, who wrote the theme right so i said well this is going to be your thing and boy he just you know i felt funny re-recording it after the fact but <laughs> since I didn't know um, since I didn't know if I was ever going to make a record like this again I said you know Chinatown has to be on there there has to be at least one Mancini on there so we did Touch of Evil yeah you know, I tried to get all the, the hits yeah yeah including a couple of things from television there's um, two things from Twilight Zone actually or two things there's CBS library music, but I learned them from Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, right. Okay. Street Moods and Jazz, which is the thing you hear. Like when the, the slot machine is ca calling out to Everett Sloan. Right, oh, right. And, you know, that. Nice. And then Fair Haired Boy, which was used in the, um, the episode where Mickey Rooney plays a jockey. Okay. Um, I nervous man in a four dollar room. Yeah, me too. Oh man, and that right, was yeah. a lot of my first. Twilight Zone used a lot of noir tropes. Oh yeah, yeah, and a lot of the people who wrote the music for it actually also, you know, Jerry Goldsmith especially wrote a lot of what we think of as being like the great film noir music. Right. So that that's kind of the crossover point, I think, for me. Gotcha. And 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 Broad Serling. I mean, just. <laughs> just right predict the worst and ye too shall be hailed as a prophet pretty much pretty much <laughs> yeah i mean again and again there's so many examples throughout that series it's 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 insane so so wait a minute though i know you're a big obviously you just need to look behind you to realize you're a big vinyl guy right oh yeah um, huge yeah. record collector um but you made this available only on vinyl <laughs> yeah, well, when it, oh, uh, so it, it the general release of it will also be streaming, but frankly, oh, okay, okay, uh, the the people who <coughs> listen to this type of film music don't tend to listen on CDs very much. Sure, um, and it really doesn't cost anything to do it for streaming. So there's no, I don't have a philosophical argument against streaming. Gotcha. Um, just that I don't think it sounds as good. Right. The, right. Yeah. It's compressed. But I never had a problem with AM radio, and AM radio was really compressed too. I just, right. Okay. Okay. It's just that there's there's an old joke about um, it might have been Lionel Newman or somebody, uh, film composer said, "How many musicians did I hire for this session? Well, it was uh, 32. Yeah. How many do you hear? I don't know. Maybe 20. Yeah. Well, you know, what are we paying for? <laughs> and, yeah. and I honestly believe that you know, like. I, I want people to hear what I've made. Of course. Uh, so, yeah. so, you know, you know, we've, we've tried to master it. So, you know, when it comes off of Spotify and Apple music, um, you'll be able to hear all the parts. Right. I'm a big sucker for clarity, uh -huh. but also I just don't expect anything miraculous to come from streaming music. It's just, right. not, you know, there, there's a reason why, why nobody has said like, 
Oh, good. Steely Dan Asia is finally available on streaming. It's true. No, it's true. It's true. And, and, and I mean, LP's vinyl in general has really made a fairly dramatic comeback in the last, what, five to ten years. Yeah, I mean, part of that, though, is also the other ways of consuming music are taking less market share. Oh, sure. So the market is yeah. smaller, but the share that's taken up by vinyl is, you know, yeah, because I'm much more measurable. It went from from this is the way I remember it. Okay, uh, in the in the '70s, listening to my my dad's records, it went from straight vinyl LPs in the '70s to. I never really got the eight track thing. I got to be honest. I didn't know much about the eight tracks. And then the cassette tapes came out and there was still vinyl though at home. It was like cassettes were played in the car and things like that. Yeah. But one of the big reasons why cassettes never fully took over the market, even though for a while they outsold LPs was because radio couldn't use them. And there were still so many different radio outlets that you still had to press Interesting. Records, okay. Because radio wasn't going to play a cassette. That's good to know. And and that, but then CDs came out, and then vinyl kind of died. <laughs> yeah, no bit. vinyl. Vinyl got killed off because um, the two biggest labels, or two of the biggest labels, just that, just absolutely said, "That's it. We're not going to press anything more on vinyl." Which was gotcha. Polygram, which later, of course, became Universal, and Warner Brothers. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, like, I sense. remember the Texas Tornadoes album not being available on vinyl. Right. Yeah. 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 I remember. I remember that. Uh, not the Texas Tornadoes, but but just just a, so there were certain artists that they just weren't available on vinyl, like at all. It just wasn't a thing. And yeah. Well, I was working in a record store at the time ah. when it was like it was like 1988, where the switch was thrown. It was going to be you know there there yeah. are certain artists that could still get their records pressed onto vinyl like Springsteen. Sure. Uh, Because, I mean, with like, with certain genres, like the uh, country, for example, interestingly enough, you would think it would be the opposite, but country, I guess it was a Nashville thing, I'm guessing, I have no idea, but um, once they hit like the mid-80s, late 80s, for like a lot of the 90s, you couldn't even find an LP in country. It just No, except, but you could find singles because jukeboxes... Gotcha. So, like, yeah. I have I have a tidy little collection of George Strait singles. Okay. Um, okay. You know, I, I, you know, I'm a guitar player, so yeah. you know, country yeah. music figures into my diet. It has but to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, uh, you know, but I'm one of those guys that just like, you know, the 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 dream scenario for me would be to to find one of those Indian Beatles seventy eights. Right. right. Okay. You know, okay. for no practical reason except that right. I just yeah. want that artifact that way. Okay, so so I'm gonna bring this up, and and we didn't talk about this before. I have no idea. I I'm just I'm just throwing it out there because I just heard personally, and it hurts me deeply. Um, my buddy who lives in L.A. I don't live in L.A. anymore. I was born and raised there, but uh, don't live in L.A. anymore. And my buddy uh, who works with Starlight told me that uh, Amoeba closed. Um, no, no, no. Amoeba moved. Oh, okay. Excellent. It was. Uh, I live about a block and a half from the old location, which right. is in okay. Sunset and yeah, Columbia, yeah, yeah. and now it's a Hollywood and Argyle. Excellent. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Yeah, right, right across from the Dunkin' Donuts. It's very okay. Cool. Well, Ryan, if you're watching this, and I know you are, uh, then there you go. It's just a new location. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's smaller though. I mean, like, oh, I'll bet it, it's got to be. Don't even yeah. get me started on overbuilding. Um, yeah, I mean, they had, you know, they had, they had an enormous building, two stories, and they essentially sold LPs, uh, CDs, and DVDs. And DVDs you don't need anymore, and CDs you don't need anymore. So, so. No, they still do an outrageous amount of, uh, of trade for CDs and DVDs. Do they? Okay. You know, and cassettes, for that matter. I do not understand that cassettes making a comeback but i don't either um because i you know basically um i thought i thought mini disc was the ultimate uh (laughs) kind of like if you're going to make your own and be able to erase it and whatever mini disc did the same job better right right okay it was always how i would uh if i had to learn like i remember when i was 
going on tour with the band NRBQ, uh-huh. I would make mini discs where I was just shuffling the order <laughs> so I would be able to practice things. And right, you know, it's like, and the thing was like smaller than a pack of camels. So right, yeah, it's just great. And you could erase, you could actually change the order. It did everything a cassette did and did it better. Better, yeah. Okay. You know, All plus right. if you were trying to bootleg a concert, uh, you got much better sound quality. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah. Okay, so you have a you have a uh, you have a career. I'm going to mention. I'm going to mention some artists here, and I'm also going to miss a whole bunch. Okay, uh, sure. but but you've worked with uh, Bootsy Collins, NRBQ, which you just mentioned, Big J McNeely, Wanda Jackson, Love Wanda. Uh, Roy Campy, um, Ray Campy, Ray Campy, sorry, uh, <laughs> Phil and Dave Alvin uh, from the Blasters, yeah. and um, obviously a whole lot, whole lot of people there. Uh, I personally am a big rockabilly fan, so so first and foremost, I I go to I go to Wanda and uh, Ray Campy and and uh, Phil and Dave Alvin with, and. So uh, talk a little bit about about that, about the rockabilly that you've been involved with. Well, I mean, the first concert I ever went to see was Elvis Presley. So I always felt <laughs> like I was uh, I was I was, you know, indoctrinated. There, there was never a period. There was never a period in my life where I wasn't listening to rockabilly music. Um, I would I would stay home. I would pretend to be sick, stay home from school and watch the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, just because I could watch Ricky Nelson do the tune at the end of the show. Right. Um, right. So, you know, when the, when the quote rockabilly revival, uh, happened, you know, and before I had, before the stray cats had hit, there were starting to be some records on a label called Roland rock. Okay. Which was, uh, helmed by a really outrageous guy, who is a rockabilly Zionist libertarian named Rock and Ronnie Weiser, right. uh, European immigrant. He re- he was the last person to record Gene Vincent. Okay. Yeah. And um, there's an album called Forever Gene Vincent. It's basically Ronnie recorded Gene on this little reel-to-reel deck in his house, and then he had Ray Campy overdub all these instruments on it, and a guy named Rip Masters. Mm-hmm. on piano and uh the recordings aren't very good um <laughs> no i mean i would really like to hear them unadorned because when you try right, to right. put all that stuff on after the fact it's you know it's just not that good but uh he was a true believer so i i had a couple of ray campy records and then somebody said there's this there's this group they're from here in philadelphia but they went to England and they're called the stray cats. Right. And I knew who Brian Setzer was because he was the guitar player in a band called the bloodless Pharaohs. Who okay. Were a decent local band. And they used to cover the theme from Perry Mason, which. I uh-huh. um, and so this, the album hadn't even come out yet. Just the single of runaway boys. It's like, Whoa. Okay. Right. Um, and then of course, in the wake of that, you know, there comes the blasters and I'd, grew up listening to rockabilly and country and blues and you know like there was i watched hee haw every week i watched the wilburn brothers every week so the blasters really resonated with me and they sure. would come to town and i hung out with them you know things were a lot more accessible back then sure and when i moved to los angeles you know dave alvin and i had been friends for a few years and he introduced me to this one and that one and the next thing you know, like the first record I wound up producing in Los Angeles from the ground up was a record with Ray Campy. And as a matter of fact, I had Dave Alvin play on a couple of cuts from it, uh, on it rather. That's he awesome. Wrote one of the songs. Yeah, it was, it was really fun because Dave and I recorded our guitar solos together. And, right. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to break this out real quick. I actually have Dave Alvin's book of poetry. Any rough times are now behind you. <laughs> I have uh, somewhere right around here. I have the early edition of oh, it's nice. over there in the California. Nice, book. but there there was a version of it before then called Nana Big Joe on the Fourth of July uh-huh. that Dave pressed up himself, 
And before that, even a book called Hit and Run Poems, which was him and two other poets. But he just put out a new book of collected stuff. Um, but yeah, there's a that that that's a wonderful book. Oh um, man, it's really good. And and, and I mean, I, this is coming from this is coming from. I mean, I wrote I wrote three books of poetry and have had you know a lot of many poems published and all that kind of stuff. And I love this book. Like literally, like, and yet, I, I like and yet, his poetry at least as much as I like his songwriting. And is and, right, and and yet you know he's a he's a songwriter. He's a, he's a he's a phenomenal guitarist, and then and then he also has a math degree. So <laughs> no, <laughs> Phil is the one with the math degree. Oh, Phil is okay. Okay, uh, Dave's degree is in English, yeah. um, which explains why Dave publishes books and Phil argues about math. There. But um, <laughs> no, I. I it was just it was just Dave's birthday uh, last Friday, and you know, I, I sent him a Sidney Bechet record for his birthday. Nice, <laughs> nice, love it. Yeah, yeah he's uh, he's still um, he's still doing it, man. He's still doing it. his his health is not great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, cancer. So uh, he's he's had to deal with uh, chemo and some stuff like that. Gotcha. But, okay. Yeah. You know, he's he's just one of those guys who you know. I don't think a little day. thing like cancer is going to, no, I think it bothers him plenty, yeah. but I think it's also like, he's just, he's a great guy. And I think karma is going to keep him with us. Excellent. Longer. Well, let's root for it. Yeah. Hell yeah. Dave. Well, I, I certainly am. It's, you know, I sent him a Sidney Bechet record for his birthday. Right. That should give him a reason to live. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, so you have a lot of experience, uh, a lot of experience it looks like both playing on and producing uh and and playing with um exotica composers musicians et yeah i was just you know it's one of those and, and i don't even wait know wait how... first 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 define for me and us the listeners what what exotica what is that it's it's a fake form of music <laughs> is, is really what it is it's like uh, a hollywood approximation of south america and the jungle and volcanoes and polynesia um okay, with latin so percussion that's kind of what okay that's great that's kind of what i thought it was <laughs> I just i just wanted to just, make sure <laughs> just picture a paper mache volcano in hollywood set to music <laughs> and that's what it is okay okay very cool and and but you've worked with with quite a few kind of famous artists in that, yeah. Yeah, although to, to be honest, it wasn't hard to get a hold of uh, people because nobody was. People were listening to it, but I don't think they were starting to examine it. If you know what I mean. Okay. Like you, you can. Have, it's sort of like the the thing I would compare it to is, you know how like. Oh, brother, where art thou came out, and all of a sudden, like, just people are buying the soundtrack album for Oh, brother, where art thou? Yes, but they're not really going out and going like, I need to know more about Ralph Stanley, or I need to know right. more about no, Tom totally. Hartford. Yeah, Americans are horrible at homework. Yeah, so true. You know, uh, I actually called up Les Baxter and I said, Hey, you don't know me, but I, I had written him a letter actually, and I said, Like, look. I can't find interviews with you from back when you were doing your music. I would like to interview you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll find a way to get the interview published because I was starting to get published. And uh, here's my phone number. Or write me back. So he called me. And uh, we started talking. And uh, I'm keeping up pretty good. And at one point he goes, well, what I really loved of Stravinsky was, do you know that that one part of Patricia, uh, I'm like, uh oh, now I'm being tested. I said, like, um, I don't mean to be rude, but um, <laughs> I think you were just singing the Royal March from La Histoire and silence, and it was probably only a few seconds, but it felt like seemed like, like forever, yeah, show. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and said, why don't you come out here? I have my scores. You can look at my music and I'll answer any questions you might have. So that became something I did. 
Nice. And then um, uh, I met Robert Trasnan. Uh, I was working with a label called Dionysus Records. Mm -hmm. And said, hey, you know, I said, we should reissue this record. And Lee Joseph, who runs the label, was like, yeah, this is amazing. So I got a hold of Robert Draz and I found him in the union book. And um, he just, he really took me under his wing. And then right. I was doing a journalism job interviewing Ema Sumac, who is like the, the greatest singer Exotica has Right, ever. right, 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 yeah. 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 You know, certainly one of the most imitated. The icon. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the template, but you know, right. Like I've only seen one singer who can do what Ema did. And, um, I worked with her recently and I was just like, wow, I see dead people. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I said like, look, we're trying to put a band together to do some gigs, but we need a guitar player. Somebody told us you play the guitar. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I play the guitar. Yeah. Just, you know, right so, place, right time. Yeah. Yeah. Like they didn't even ask me to audition. I said, well, am I going to audition? <laughs> and they said, yeah, we like, probably you better. Cause we don't know if you know, right. Right. We don't know. We if know you, you know about the music. Team. So they hand me a sheet of music and I read as badly as any guitar player, but I was like, Oh, Malambo number one. I know this. So, I sit there with her music director, the piano player, play the thing down. They said, well, that was really impressive. I was like, really? They said, yeah, you didn't just play the page we gave you. You played the other page that we didn't give you. So, you know, but I, you didn't really have a chance to do anything expressive or anything that was like really creative on that. Right. I believe that. Yeah, sure. It was so it was like an under rehearsed oldies act because everything was disorganized and you're just trying to play the music. So there weren't any disasters, <laughs> right. You know, I, 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 cause you know, just things where she was not managed. Well, there was never a, a, a real budget for rehearsal and things. Right. Like that. Okay. Yeah. So you're just kind of going, okay, hold on. May work, may not work. And uh, we got through it. Okay. But, it wasn't actually until recently when there was a, a concert in honor of her hundredth birthday. There was a singer called uh, Lena Marie Cardinal doing Ema's parts, and the band was really well rehearsed. And I got to hear what it could have been. Right. Okay. Very and cool. I was on. I, they brought me on to play. As a matter of fact, to play Malambo Number no. One, and it was <laughs> like, oh my god, this is so fun! Like, right. you know, like. I wish it could have been this when she was alive. Totally. Yeah. The, 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 the kid is a kid. He's not, he, he can't be that much younger than me. Uh, his name is Damon divine. If Damon had been her manager, good things would have happened. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Cause he really, there's the, uh, there's been a postage stamp in Peru of her. Um, a statue has been erected of her at Hollywood forever cemetery. Right. And, um, one block of Hollywood has been uh, denoted Ema Sumac Square, and that was all Damon's doing. Gotcha. Very cool. You know, yeah. Cool. So I, you know, there there weren't that many people still alive who were first generation Exotica people. Exotica, yeah. And they were very happy to talk about it and sort of pass down the 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 recipe for the secret sauce. And I'm, and I was too happy, and and that, that was basically how I learned. Especially Robert Dresden, he was really the one who, you know, I mean, the only two people really doing what I'm, you know, this at all in terms of like younger people were me and Joey Altruda. Okay, and Joey was already like nine streets past me by then. You know, he had he had studied, and the guys who did this stuff weren't in Philadelphia where I was. They were here, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. so I get here, and he'd already been around them for like fifteen years. Going, oh, right. let me tell you about Leonard Roseman writing the score from Rebel Without a Cause. Where the hell did you <laughs> learn that? Oh, Lenny told me. Here, I let me right. show you the music he wrote out for me. <laughs> so yeah. that's when I went. Like, I'm never leaving Los Angeles because this right. is where. And 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 what what year was that when you moved to LA? Oh, uh, it was the end of '95. Okay, so um, until. So until until ninety five, you were in Philly. 
Yeah, until I was 30. I, I spent my 30th birthday here, actually with Lee Joseph. Then I went back to Philly for six weeks, then came back to Los Angeles okay. and stayed. I just said, I'll stay here until I run out of money. <laughs> and then maybe I'll go back. And I ran out of money in the middle of February. And I said, do I really want to go back to Philadelphia in the middle of February? Right. No. Nobody does. Yeah. No. So, so, I so, just so, so, so since you're a Philly guy, since you're a Philly guy, I mean, 30 years, 30 years, yeah. you're a Philly guy, right? You're, you're an LA transplant, but you're a Philly guy. So um, Eagles fan, Flyers fan. Uh, Sixers fan and boxing fan. Sixers those, and boxers. Those, okay. those, yeah, uh, like the, the, I just think hockey's barbaric, so sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. When I was a kid growing up, the Phillies couldn't win anything. So like, right. Once I left town, hey, they're kicking ass. Yeah. And the Eagles of my youth were just substandard, so I never – Yeah. like a, a football fan in Philadelphia when I was a kid was looking to Pittsburgh because that was the <laughs> Pittsburgh of Terry Bradshaw, Lynn Swan. Well, yeah, the Steelers in the and 70s. And similarly – and similarly, the Pirates, too. Sure. Okay. Okay. So, you know, like we, if we were paying attention to football in Pennsylvania, we were looking to the Northwest. Uh, gotcha. Because, you know, Roman Gabriel is not, uh, is not one of the most well-remembered quarterbacks of the era. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he was a Ram, too, and he was, he was definitely not my, uh, my dad's favorite Ram, so. <laughs> no, I was going to say, nobody... I, I think that I think when he went to Philadelphia, it was like, you know, like because I forget who it was that replaced him on the Rams, but it was somebody halfway decent. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I want to say James Harris. That, that might be wrong. Anyway, no, it was James Harris because uh, yeah. that the same year that uh, the same year that Plunkett went to the to, uh, to New England. God, I can't believe I remember <laughs> all this. Yeah, nice. <laughs> okay, so hey. So so let's so let's talk uh, noir for a minute, and I'm talking. Oh. So so I know you're a big noir fan, and um, so let's start with let's start with books, authors, because I know that you're well read, and I know you have have a lot out there. So favorite uh, noir authors or books in particular? Well, being from Philadelphia, David Goodis. Okay, um, yeah. Yep. As you'll notice, Dark Passage is his name for Dark Passage, uh, which is written by Goodis. And there's also a tune on the record that I wrote kind of as a salute to Lalo Schifrin um, okay. called Street of No Return, which is also the name of um, a Goodis book that was made into the only bad Samuel Fuller movie. Uh, I love Fuller, but I like Fuller did a Goodis. This sucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it really looked like an 80s variety show. Right. And I love Fuller, but that one. But yeah, good as uh, Black Friday uh, and uh, Night Squad are my favorite of the goodest novels. Okay. I don't know if they're necessarily the best, but they each grab a certain Cassidy's girl, too. They each grab a certain thing about Philadelphia that I recognize very vividly. Very cool. Like what uh, Black Friday starts with a guy shop uh, shoplifting an overcoat on a cold winter day on market street. It's like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Market yeah. street is market streets. The, the street with all the shops that leads right up to city hall. And there's always that guy standing out and he's wearing a big fur coat. He's got like a rack with other fur coats. And as you're walking by, he's going, got that fur coat. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, okay. So, so I want to point out real quick that in the review that we have coming out next month, um, 12 different authors, and it's all pulp stuff. Um, a guy named Charlie Jones has a story in there called Independence Day 1992. And it is based in Philadelphia, all, all in Philadelphia. And the majority of the stuff he writes is all Philadelphia. So so when that oh, comes I out, you've got to take a look. It. Please let me know. Yeah. Um, also, obviously, like Raymond Chandler, because yeah. not everything Chandler wrote was great. But his best has never been yeah, I know. It's, um, it's so it's, good. It's yeah, so good. The, the, the Long Goodbye, uh, Farewell, My Lovely, and Lady in the Lake are each masterpieces. I've read everything. I've read his letters a million times. Right. Um, and the I letters. Like, I like playback a lot 
and that that doesn't playback get mentioned is that much. really underrated. Yeah, um, it's I, I, I really it's like a, it, but you never very hear about breezy it. Breezy book. What's that? Um, it's a very breezy book. The, the, yeah. The, yeah. the reason why playback doesn't get the respect is because it came after the long goodbye. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. Which is really his. He wrote it when his wife was dying, and you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I actually was put in charge of restoring Chandler's operetta. Nice. No, I was not. So aware of I was doing. Yeah, I, uh, it's called the Prince and the Peddler, and so I was doing all this research on. Basically, he was writing this opera while he was stealing the wife of Julian Pascal who was the guy who wrote the okay. music for the operetta. So okay. it would seem to me that this was the pretense for Chandler coming over and hanging out with, with Mrs. Pascal. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, like Chandler was not necessarily the most faithful husband, but I think one of the things about the long goodbye is that Sissy was very much his lifeline. Hmm. And uh, she was dying, as he said, by half inches as he was writing that book. Right. And there's a certain amount of exhaustion in that book. That's, you know, you talk about something burning by the glow of its own intensity. Right. It's a phrase of Chandler's. That book does. Whereas playback is more like shorter, much lighter, breezier, unencumbered. It is. And oh, it is. Dare yeah. I say fun. It is, yeah. For for a Chandler book, it really is, yeah. Marlo, yeah. Marlo, even Marlo is even almost fun in, in that book. Yeah, no, it's 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 a it's a very light read, and I've read it fairly often because I was thinking, you know, I haven't revisited that in a while, and you know, pretty much the same as when if you've read the Pat Hobby stories by Fitzgerald. I have no. Oh, they're 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 these short stories about a screenwriter in Hollywood. Okay, and. Yeah. They're at the end of his life and by no means as much of a grand slam as Gatsby or Last Tycoon or what have you. But God damn it, boy, could he write. And boy, could he yeah, write something he that would make you turn pages. Right. So uh, Chandler was another one. The the three or four great James M. Kane novellas, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Mildred Pierce, Double Indemnity. Double, Inde Double Indemnity is probably my favorite movie, but also the novella is fantastic. Yeah. Well, Postman too. And I love Serenade. Yeah, Postman. Yeah. You know, and 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 they really are novellas. I mean, they're they're like if you were to trust me, if you if you were to try to get that published nowadays at 105 pages or whatever, it'd be a nightmare because no, you you couldn't. Nobody yeah. wants that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it if it's not 250 plus pages, publishers are looking at you like, what? This isn't a book. Yeah, what, like well, what are you doing a, we don't do travel pamphlets here. Right, right, right. Exactly. And then, yeah. as I'm sure you know, there there are so many of these, uh, so many authors who wrote like that one great book, right? You know, or or, or you know, like Williford, uh, you know, Charles Williford. Um, yeah. Who was the guy that wrote uh, uh, Night of the Hunter? Davis Grubb. Yeah. Uh, and then That's the guy who wrote too. Badge of Evil. Yes. Oh, I love that movie, Badge of Evil, which later became Touch of Evil. Is that Whit Masterson? That that's a great Harry movie. Whittington, yeah. That's a great movie too. I mean, yeah. Wells Wells does a wonderful job, and and I'm gonna be honest with you, I am not a fan of. I'm not a big Charlton Heston fan. I'm just not. But, no, me either. But, even but though I, I share a birthday with him, but I love watching him like unravel in that movie. <laughs> it's such a people. He he does a he 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 does a nice job, and Wells is Wells is great too. But yeah, my my line about when we when we play the theme live is here's the best song ever about blowing up Venice because the <laughs> yeah. opening like people think it's some Mexican border. No, that's no, Venice. Ven that's Venice Beach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of course. You know, yeah. and, and you can still do the tracking shot. Somebody I yeah. knew did it not that long ago with a drone. Yeah, it is. It see. is a great it is a great tracking shot, though. It is the I except mean, for the good fella kitchen scene. You know the the walk through the then he kissed me scene where they go to the Copa. That's the best tracking shot ever. You know? Right, right. But yeah. um, but you know a lot of these books bury me deep by Harold Q. Monsieur, and we haven't even touched on Mickey Spillane, which while they're not 
necessarily great books. They're great <laughs> gateways into film noir. They are. Um, oh, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I looked at the cover of One Lonely Night. And, well, there's a woman like, you know, long, dark hair suspended from the ceiling. Like, even if this book sucks, this cover's worth a dime because it was well, 1982 in a thrift store. Well, you know what? Honestly, man, like, do you, I swear um, something that that uh, hard case crime gets right. Is and they those get, covers. The, the covers, yeah. I mean, they, the thing is, is, is in order to do those as a publisher, you have to have the capital to be able to pay the artist to do those. But, yeah. but they, I mean, they're. You look back at the at the you know, and we post them all the time on on our Instagram. But you you look back at those thirties, forties, and and mid fifties uh, pulp covers, and I'm not even talking books. I'm talking you know, men's adventure and, and, you know, startling stories and all that. And they're, they're brilliant. I mean, they're, they're great. And, and like you said, they sold as many copies as the stories inside did. Sure. Maybe more. Hey, there's, there's going to be a machine gun and a topless brunette and commies. Yeah. That's (laughs) worth a nickel. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that's, that's you know there, there's there's a lot to be said for that i mean there's there's and yet nowadays a lot of people don't do that you know there's there's not the, as, as let me put it like this as much as we hearken to that period and go that was great there's not a whole lot of artists nowadays doing that kind of work no it's it's so i mean when i commissioned the album cover for the film and orchestra record i cal Schenkel who did all the famous Frank Zappa album covers and uh, the first four Tom Waits albums and Trout Mask Replica. I just knew it was like, you know what? We better not be in a hurry because this, he's not going to, he's not going to phone this job in. Uh And and it's like those old days of illustrators are, it's a guy at an easel going "Mm, mm." the same way as, you know, how, how does this music get written? It's me at, at a little table going, you know, dot, 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 stem, 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 beam, rest, you know, right. all the stuff that goes into it. It's a very, it's a very work intensive process. Yeah. And, okay. So as much as we talk with Noir, as much as we talk books and we talk cover art, things like that, film Noir has probably the biggest influence of any of them. and. And it's are, it's the most international language, I think. It really is because I mean, you know, that uh, Britain has made some great noir. Uh, Japan has made great noir. France, of course, has made great noir, and obviously, uh, you know, Hollywood ha- has made has made kind of the many of the iconic noir films as well. Uh, hey, so, what could be more iconic than Rafifi or The Bad Sleep Well? You know, yeah. The, 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 the thing that's interesting to me, and this is like, when I was a kid sort of venturing out of the house, mm-hmm. uh, during the time when, like, when I had my, to use Henry Rollins' phrase, when I had my ears on for the punk rock, mm-hmm. uh, you start to notice things outside of your own neighborhood. And most of the world was operating on some pretty bland software. It was Hotel California Chicken McNugget beige white person shopping mall shit. Right. Then now all of a sudden you're going to the quote art movie house. And that was the place where they would have Rocky horror on the weekend at midnight and whatever. And that was where I first saw Rafifi. And that was where I first saw eight and a half. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I started to notice was that like, I would go see different science fiction movies just because nothing else is going on. And for like two fifty, I could go see something. Right. And science fiction did not like in, uh, in Japan, it's Mothra in yeah. Italy. It's rocket ships. There was not an international shorthand. Right. Or, sure. uh, but for film noir, man, you look the bad sleep. Well, it looks not unlike, Kiss Me Deadly looks not unlike Rafifi. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. Looks not unlike uh, the big combo. Yeah. So yeah. the thing that Hollywood really did was create an international style. Yeah. Everybody could do their own version of. Yeah. Um, and oh, then... Although although Hollywood borrowed from the French on that, too. Sure. Also yeah. the Germans, because, you know... Okay. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, early German. Uh, what the German expression is, you know, yeah. like, you look at the cabinet of Dr. Kilgari, then you look at double indemnity, it's like, ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's, you know, th those guys were checking out some... And, and, of course, like, a lot of the people who made those German expressionist films were either uh, Jewish or homosexual or Jewish homosexuals. Right. You know? including the guy who made probably four of the 10 greatest American movies, Billy Wilder, uh -huh. Wilder. Yeah. You know, and Wilder, you know, double indemnity, uh, ace in the hole, the apartment and uh, sunset Boulevard. You know, we made out well on that deal. You know, you yes, got to yes, keep Lenny rep and style. We got Billy Wilder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we did. But <coughs> Billy Wilder showed up here already well versed in you know i don't use this word incorrectly just american iconography sure. and i hate yeah. the word iconic because you know like to me anything less famous than the cover of like abbey road is not iconic it right. might be famous but the golden arches are iconic popeye's right. chicken isn't so <laughs> but you know Bubsy Berkeley and all that kind of stuff. Um, but but you know what? That's the iconic stuff of its era. King I think Tom. sometimes I, I think sometimes people that are coming to America might know the icons better than we do because that they've been distilled. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And and so you know, they you walk down you ask somebody in Calcutta, what's America? Mickey Mouse, Michael Jackson, Apple Computer. You know, like yeah. They they narrow it down to six things. Right, right. You know, and, and whereas and, and Americans wouldn't do that. Americans wouldn't do that, but uh, no. I mean, Americans Americans love Rachel Ray, but they don't know what to make of Anthony Bourdain. So you know, yeah. yeah, figure it that way. You know, <laughs> Am Americans will not watch the Nicholas Brothers, but they will watch Dancing with the Stars. <coughs> yes, they will. And yes, that will. just tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> about you know it's it, it, there's a there's a famous story about um you know like um somebody asked george harrison on the first beatles tour like was there anything he was hoping to see he said muddy waters and the journalist said do you mean the miss like, where's that yeah because you don't even know who your own famous people are it, yeah yeah well and and, and, we, and we didn't pay him either yeah yeah, <laughs> but you you look at like Kurosawa, you know, High and Low was I believe a John Le Carre novel, um, and again it's like film noir became probably the most universal language because the musical trends in different places weren't necessarily in, uh, pardon the musical trends in different places weren't necessarily the same right as right they right, right yeah. You know, you see all these English movies like uh, Espresso Bongo and whatever. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a Cliff Richard, whoever it was, was like a huge star there. But if he came to America, it would be at the bottom of the board. Right. Yeah. Um, so but film noir, fedoras, guns. OK, bad people doing bad things. Shadows. Fog. Yeah. <laughs> Shadows. Fog. Venetian blinds with a light coming through them. You right. know. Yeah. And. One of the things I was trying to do, but frankly, and I'll get to how this happened in a second. I was trying to point to the international nature, not only of the films themselves, but how the music traveled through those films. Right. Because Rafifi, the, the great French heist movie, probably the greatest heist movie ever made. Um, I love the theme from that. And I really wanted to have a great vehicle for Kristen Habelwitz my clarinetist because she's just my work wife as i call her you know she's mm -hmm. one of the people who whenever things have got to go up a notch she's one of the first calls right I said hey you know she's like oh yeah rafifi sure yeah you know, she had never seen the movie but she had heard the theme gotcha that out 
And I also wanted to do the opening of either Yujimbo or The Bad Sleep Well, because Makura Soto's music for the Kurosawa films is it's as important as Henry Mancini with Blake Edwards or Nina Rota with Fellini. But what happened there, oh, and lest I forget, I did Beat Girl by John Barry because I right. was just like, I don't want to do one of the James Bond movies because James Bond is sort of what noir, noir eventually develops into. You know, you've got yeah, that sure. sort of yeah. international yeah, man of intrigue, man from uncle. Right, you know. right, yeah. But Beat Girl, his first his first score is like this English juvenile delinquent movie. And it's really charming. And, mm. you know, it's, it's about a girl who finds out that her new stepmother's a stripper. So right, right. yeah, belongs perfectly with this. So there's England, Rafifi, that's France. And I was going to do Soto, which is Japan. But a friend of mine named Brandon Drake said, uh, are, are you going to do any of the CBS television stuff? And I said, you know, I've been working on street moods and jazz, just transcribing it forever. But I don't know if I would get it done in time. He's like, oh, well, I have the music for that. And it's five and a half minutes of music. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a if you watch Twilight Zone, you have heard this cue. Anytime right. there's a real film noir episode of Twilight Zone. Nine times out of ten, this cue is going to be in it. Right. And it's one of my favorites. It was written by a guy named Rene Garyawank who aside from this cue, mostly I recognize his music in Westerns of that period. And I don't know if you know this, but Rod Serling's first show after Twilight Zone was a Western. Nice. No, I did not. Yeah. With a team by Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah. So I said like, okay, I got to knock five minutes off of something somewhere. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the Japanese stuff got uh, excised. So gotcha. I could put some yeah. and jazz in there. Yeah. But I but the music took on an international flavor. The films definitely came across as an international language because even with subtitles, you can watch Rafifi and yeah, 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 yeah. really yeah. get roped into it in a big yeah. way. And obviously High and Low is one yeah. of the most suspenseful movies. You know, Bad Sleep Well is a little more Shakespearean. High and Low is more seedier pants. Yeah. And I really wanted to point to the the internationality of the yeah. style. Yeah. But you know what's so I, interesting that about noir too, and and I'm a, obviously I realize this is a paradox and contradictory and all that, but I I somehow view it in a lot of ways as well, especially film noir as absolutely international, and yet when I think of noir. I kind of think of American. Well, that's because if film noir or noir, you know, the Romana Clef at its purest is really the logical next phase of the Western. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's, it's really rooted in the Western, a good man who's not necessarily a decorous man. No. Is going to right a wrong. And, and yeah. instead of a horse, now he's got a car. And now he's got a he's 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 got a he's got a forties coupe, and yeah, and a fedora. Yeah, uh. yeah. And you know the obviously, you know, you have like Eric Amble's sort of anti-hero version of that, right? Which finds its American apogee in Columbo. Sure. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, you you couldn't be more right that. The thing itself, the source material itself, is the product of an American fiction evolution. The thing is, because film took over the international imagination. Yeah, definitely. Um, did like, yeah, okay. W. D. Griffith or D. W. Griffith is the first filmmaker that everybody wants to say that man was a great filmmaker. Mm -hmm. That's great, but the first one who we can identify a movie by is Chaplin who is English and sure you know and obviously when you when you look over the history of of the evolution of film it's not strictly an American thing right oh absolutely yeah yeah you know you, you even even you want to look over animation it's not even strictly an American thing yeah yeah you know I mean obviously we're starting with Disney and, and that peer group 
But when you go, well, how far did, what's really the evolution of it? You get to the late 60s and see like the Eastern European guys. Uh, the guy who did La Ruca, I can never remember his name, but I don't know. Do you know La Ruca? It's the one, it's the hand. Look it up. It's on YouTube and it's just absolutely. Okay. Some of the best social commentary ever. Will and do. then, you know, as, as America's sort of gone like, yeah, and making more bland cartoons, then you see Nick Park come up. Right. And here's Wallace and Gromit, and you're just going right. like. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, that's kind a, of the history of film. There's a huge opportunity right now because what's coming out of Hollywood for the most part is, is and I mean Hollywood, I don't mean internationally, I mean Hollywood, yeah. is trash. I mean, it's just, it's comic book movie after comic book movie after comic book movie. And so there, there's a huge opportunity, is my point out there, internationally, for for somebody to really kind of you know grab onto something and bring people in because don't get me wrong I, I'm you know I grew up with comic books too and I I, I you know I was a big Batman fan and I think Deadpool yeah but how many bat when but, I was a kid we only needed one Batman and it was Adam West <laughs> you so, know so yeah I mean it's it, you know it's 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 one of those things where it just it just goes on and on and on it's 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 crazy but there's a there's a big opportunity out there right now for for, I, for some, well the the last movie some that really somewhere the the last movie that everybody was going like whoa I didn't see that coming was Korean yeah you know like Parasite was the last time I saw anybody yeah you know prior to that maybe the last movie I saw anybody talk about in a certain way was like something like American Beauty or Boogie Nights right where right. the narrative really got dialed in in a totally different way yeah so i think the fact that the world is getting more you know when you see korean pop music getting a big hold in the american marketplace because let's face it this country has not exactly been like you know name five top 10 hit records that aren't in english that have been top 10 hits in this country Oh, yeah, no, you can't. 99 Luft Balloons. Yeah. Uh, Sukiyaki. And after that, I'm kind of, you know, like. Uh, uh, wait, uh, uh, Despacito? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's one. <laughs> okay. There's, th there's three. And there's we have three, just been yeah. through like a 60 year. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that, that film also like all these streaming properties have, have taken on a different, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so you're seeing like the, the, the sort of post Sopranos mini series, right. Becoming a way that people can, for, for lack of better words, make a 12 hour movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, well, but they can also tell a truer story and in particular, in particular, any kind of, um, novel adaptation, lends itself much more to a well, series. Well, so if you saw the, the Mildred Pierce adaptation with Guy Pierce, um, I thought that was just fantastic. Yeah, I mean... I, mean, he, I really loved every minute of it. He, even even on Netflix, the uh, the Michael Connelly Lincoln Lawyer series this, this last year was, you know, all of a sudden you're looking at eight episodes and you get to explore the whole novel as opposed to the, the hour and a half Matthew McConaughey, you know, vehicle which again it just it really lends itself these days to doing that and you're getting better directors a lot of money and better actors going into streaming well, i was going to say before you would you would you would have to almost say like who can we get rather than who do we want yeah you know when you look oh, at like who the cast were of law and order yeah, the the only one who who was really famous before they got the gig was Jerry Orbach. Right, and he didn't have the grandest reputation as no, a no, no, actor. Yeah. It was just yeah. Dirty Dancing and uh, Prince of the City. Now you're starting to see people like well, not starting to see, but in the last few years, it's like oh, Billy Bob Thornton, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. or David Carradine, the, the the Fargo television show. Just going like. Stop with all the talent already. Yeah, yeah. Or holy shit, to see like, you know, uh, Henry Winkler reanimated. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah. I think Barry is one of the best things I've ever. Barry's seen. funny. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. It's well done. Saw, saw NoHo Hank in the farmers market about 
two months ago, I was like, whoa, it's no Hank. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, the, I mean, obviously, it's taken technology a pretty long time to change our watching habits the way it's changed our listening habits. Yes, for sure. Because, it, you know, miniaturization was the thing that made high speed really worth something. Right. Because, you know, what, what's high speed internet if you're going to have to watch it at home? Yeah. It's just a faster computer. But now we can watch Netflix on our phone. We can <laughs> listen to every record we've ever owned on Spotify. Um, yeah. But also binge watching as a thing. Oh, yeah. Wasn't really available to us before. But now Netflix, Netflix is dropping entire seasons. Yeah. You know, I've, been, I've been watching yeah. Cupheads lately because a friend of mine does the music for it. And I can just watch a bunch of those little suckers in a row. Right, They're right. just great. And his, yeah. his music is just a fellow named Ego Plum. And the music is just great. So, you know, I'm just, and I just went like, oh, yeah, that's right. Because I watched Tiger King in its entirety in like two <laughs> right. days. Right. It felt dirty afterwards, but I did watch it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> my mom, who's 75, she, she binge watches shows all the time. <laughs> <laughs> just, just just knocks them out like bam 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 yeah well yeah. you know i don't think my mother's ever going to watch better call Saul, for instance I, I don't really think you know it's one of those things but every now and then something will come up and she'll like she'll be like oh yes we watched all of that I'm yeah like, you know but my mother is of course a retired librarian and you, you can't scare librarians about technology right 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 you know all right skip you can't well, scare them about being obsolete yeah, well, yeah. Uh, no, so you just did. You just posted Twilight Zone, man. Yeah. yeah, Twilight Zone. The absolute, the 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 obsolete man. They tried to get rid of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Simple In the library. name of God, let me out. Yeah. Damn. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. So so good to talk to you. Good chat. Hang out a couple minutes. Uh, and um, first off, uh, go to KillerKernRecords.com. That's Kern. K E R N, like the river, Kern yes. River. Those are like you, the Kern River. Um, KillerKernRecords.com. Uh, they're, they're, the records right now are on uh, pre sale, I believe. Is that right, Skip? Yeah. Um, and they're, it's, uh, that what you're holding is the first edition, which was the GoFundMe edition. And uh, the Killer Kern folks, which is actually a guy named Dylan Gertson, yeah. said, like, I heard about that. Can I put it out? It like, nice. Beautiful. That's awesome. I didn't even have to play it for him, you know. That's awesome. I, it, so, could, it could be awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Um, so, so no, it's uh, marginally and, passable. <laughs> right, right. And and as for Starlight Pulp, we got two books coming out next month. Uh, I'm actually looking at literally tonight after the podcast. I'm looking at the e-proof copies. So fingers crossed on that. We're hoping we're hoping uh, everything's coming together, but. It looks good, and uh, um, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, Skip, thank you. And, thank you uh, for having me. It was really an honor. Of course, man. Oh, absolutely. And everybody else, uh, thanks so much. See you guys next time. In this topsy turn.